And welcome to the first Policy Pizza and Pint of the 2014-2015 season. My name is Robert Ermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. MIPR seeks to improve public policy deliberations in capacity in Manitoba by initiating conversations and debate on current and emerging issues face the province, by publishing original research and by engaging with the post-secondary sector, citizens, government and non-governmental organizations to support public policy dialogue in the broadest sense. Tonight we're going to be talking about the 2014 Manitoba flood. This past spring and summer saw heavy flooding return to Manitoba. What's the damage this time around? What measures were taken to mitigate the damage? And what could have been done differently? What sort of progress has been made on intergovernmental flood management? We'll just finish that at a different point in the sentence. Um, most importantly, what are we learning from our experiences, particularly the events of 2011? And are we becoming better flood managers? Discussing these issues and answering our questions this evening are Minister Steve Ashton and Dr. Genevieve Ali. The Honorable Steve Ashton was first elected to the Manitoba Legislature in 1981 and has since been re-elected eight consecutive times. He is currently the Minister of Infrastructure and Transportation and the Minister responsible for emergency measures. He has held many cabinet portfolios including conservation, intergovernmental affairs, and water stewardship. Dr. Genevieve Ali is an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Manitoba. She is chair of the Watershed Systems Research Program, created to study water quality issues in the Lake Winnipeg watershed. Her core area of expertise is the development of conceptual models to predict when and how runoff nutrients and sediments are likely to leave land and reach waterways. Our moderator this evening is Mr. Paul Simon. Paul Simon is the editor of the Winnipeg Free Press. He joined the Winnipeg Free Press in 1988. As a reporter, Paul wrote for every section of the paper covering elections, wars overseas, the funerals of royals, princess, and a prime minister. A graduate of the University of Winnipeg at Grand River College, he's helped lead the Free Press's political coverage here in Denver for a decade in Ottawa as bureau chief before being named city editor in 2007. In the summer of 2012, Paul was promoted editor, becoming the 15th person to hold that office since the Free Press began publishing in 1872. That sounds like job security. <laughs> I'm in the media, there is no job <laughs> Well, thank you all again for coming out tonight. At the end of today's discussion, I encourage you to complete the feedback forms on your tables, and I'll pass the mic over to Paul for a brief introduction before we get going. Thank you so much, Robert, and uh, welcome everyone uh, to the Free Press News Cafe. It's remarkable that we are discussing uh, the 2014 uh, flood, which probably is leading candidate to be uh, the Free Press uh, news story of the year. And the way things are going, the news story of 2015, the news story of 2016. Now, a bit of irony for those of you who are watching at home here tonight, it's a beautiful evening. It's the second day of fall. We're having summer-like activities. Quick show of hands. Should we move the panel outside onto the patio? Okay. It's a wonderful evening. Uh, there is the chance of precipitation is zero. Um, and I dare say even farmers in southwest Manitoba are happy this evening. Those who, of course, have any crops that they're able to harvest. Um, a little bit of an anecdote here about the unpredictability that at, at its heart, I think, is what was driving the, this news story and this public policy issue, is the unpredictability. Uh, much like a provincial government, uh, the free press budgets each year, and part of what we have to try and do is what might we need to spend to cover a flood. Uh, to cover a flood, flood if it's coming up the Red River, or if we're going to try and have to go down the Cinnaboyne and then service, etc., etc. Um, we figured we had passed the all clear signal. So much so that on uh, Jan June 25th, I got a plane with my son and flew to England. And then I was looking at my uh, Free Press website, uh, www.winnipegfreepress.com. I recommend it hourly. Um, and I was looking at our website and I went, holy smokes, it's really raining on Canada Day. And then I realized it did more than rain. Then all of a sudden we were into the middle of a full-blown flood on a long weekend and I knew that we were going to be scrambling back home. And if we were scrambling back home, Steve Ashton and company were scrambling and people who were experts at water and hydrology were trying to figure out what the hell was going on in our province again. We're going to try and get some of those issues uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to look obviously at the politics and the public policy side, and then we have an expert on science. 
Um, I'm going to moderate this event. We're going to open it up with some uh, remarks from both uh, the minister and the professor. And then what we want to do is get the discussion going. So without further ado, I will turn to the Honourable Minister of Flooding. That's not his official title, but really, when you think about Steve Ashton, you think about flooding. Over to you, Steve. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, well, first, first of all, um, I, I think one of the key things I'd like to emphasize, in addition to being uh, uh, plus 26, as Paul's pointed out, uh, uh, the, the, the focus of the world is on climate change. And I'm not going to only talk about climate change in my comments, uh, but if anybody's doubted that climate change is real, I would suggest they look at some of the experience of the last number of years uh, that we've experienced right here uh, in Manitoba, and there I say elsewhere across Canada. Uh, one of the predictions of climate change is greater instability of weather. We're seeing greater instability of weather. Uh, we're seeing uh, weather patterns that are off the radar screen uh, that don't match uh, any of the historic experience, whether it be uh, in flooding, and I'm going to reference most of my comments in terms of flooding, obviously, or the fact that Manitoba, uh, just a few years ago, we had a level five tornado, highest reported uh, tornado uh, in history. That shows the degree to which uh, what we're dealing with is certainly climate change, and it does raise all sorts of broader questions about what the, the new normal is and how you plan and react uh, to some of the changes we're seeing. And dare I say, fundamentally, uh, we have to ask ourselves uh, the question at what time do we get the political will uh, uh, nationally and internationally to tackle climate change? Uh, because if we don't, we're going to see a uh, uh, continuation of these kind of impacts. But so let's uh, put in perspective some of the things we are seeing and how it impacts in terms of flooding in this province. Uh, we had um, uh, very significant flooding uh, in 2009. We had very significant flooding in uh, 2011. Very significant flooding in 2014. Uh, three very different but somewhat interconnected uh, floods in terms of some of the experience. And dare I say, in, 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 in recent years, uh, if you go back to 1997, we've seen uh, a number of historic floods. And I want to start with, you know, uh, we often talk about a 1 in 100, 1 in 200, 1 in 3 here, 100 year flood. That doesn't mean you have another 100 years if it's a 100 year flood. We've certainly seen that the last period of time. Uh, let's take 2011, which of course is uh, by far the most significant flood we've seen in this province, uh, really going back to uh, 1950 in terms of impacts. 1.2 billion dollars worth of damage. Uh, in terms of its, uh, uh, it, it, its sweep across the province, in terms of its impact, in terms of number of days, uh, uh, very significant. You compare it to this year, for example, uh, about four times the uh, uh, number of days, uh, nearly double the flows, and this is a year which we did have some very <coughs> significant flooding. Uh, let's look also at some of the reality of uh, the impacts that we saw in 2011, even into 2014. Uh, the degree to which, uh, in, in every one of these floods in recent years, uh, a good part of southern Manitoba has been impacted, and it's impacted differently uh, in each year. Let's go back to 2009. Uh, it impacted very uh, significantly uh, in the red river, both south and north of Winnipeg. Uh, there were other impacts, uh, most notably uh, First Nations communities such as uh, Pegasus, but it was very much the Red River flood. Uh, in 2011, people may not remember, we did have flooding in the Red River, but it was uh, relatively minor compared to certainly the 2009 flood, but we had significant impacts in 2011 all throughout the Assembly watershed, uh, part of lands, uh, and again, uh, First Nations communities were dramatically impacted. Uh, 2014, Southwest Manitoba, which was impacted in 2000, particularly on the Suris, uh, but was hit with very significant overland flood. Uh, and again, uh, impacts in the Assiniboine, and again, the kind of mobilization that we saw uh, both in 2011 and 2014 to maintain our, our flood mitigation. Very significant impacts. Now, what's the Manitoba response been historically? Well, going back to the 1950 flood, let's put it in a historic context here. In 1950, there were 100,000 uh, uh, homes evacuated. Uh, actually, 100,000 people. 10,000 homes were destroyed in the flood. Much of uh, uh, southern Manitoba was uh, devastated. E uh, even here in Winnipeg, 
We were within 48 hours of the military uh, taking over full control and evacuating the city. That's the flood of record in 1950. Uh, there was significant flood aid in, in, in other areas of the province. Uh, Lake Manitoba was flooded for about uh, two, two and a half year period uh, in the 1950s. So there are other flood impacts, uh, flooding in the Assiniboine. What came out of that was um, a realization, a political debate at first, but a realization that led to some very significant in terms of uh, investments in terms of flood infrastructure. Things such as uh, obviously the floodway, which was completed in 1968, uh, the Fairford uh, uh, structure, which releases water from Lake Manitoba, completed in 1961, the Portage Diversion, completed in 1970, uh, and the uh, the Shell Meltdown. A broader vision of flood mitigation uh, that uh, uh, was based very much on the experience of the 1950 flood. We then got hit with the 1997 flood, which was described as the flood of the century. Uh, and we came that close to uh, the protections that have been put in place uh, being overwhelmed, particularly in the Red River Valley. Now, what did we learn from that? Probably the best example is, uh, uh, is that the floodway, best investment we've ever made, but we had to invest it, uh, further in it. So we now have expanded the floodway. It's now a one in 700 year flood protection, thanks to that expansion. Uh, we uh, put in ring dikes, mini dikes in the Red River Valley, uh, protected those uh, communities. So then what happened? In 2009, we had a flood that was uh, greater than 1950, and there was one home impacted by water seepage. That's the value of mitigation. Uh, by the way, the current accounting for the floodway, uh, which was controversial in its day, is that we've saved $38 billion worth of damage. And God knows how many people would have been uh, uh, flood victims as a result. Now, if you want to put it in comparison, uh, Look what happened in Alberta in, in, in uh, uh, 2013. And I've got lots, I actually quite, quite a few relatives in Alberta. <clears throat> Look at how they were devastated. You want to put in comparison how they're now learning really what we learned many years ago. Uh, Calgary has one in 25 year flood protection. Downtown Calgary. But they had a report that was released in 2005 that talked about doing flood mitigation. They didn't release it publicly. They didn't act on it. They got hit with a major flood in 2013. I think their total cost not including uh, only Calgary, but other areas, is about $3 billion. So, you know, uh, we often talk about the Manitoba model. It's true. Now, it's not just the floodway, by the way, um, uh, or the, uh, the ring dikes. Uh, I'll talk about some of the stuff we've, uh, we've done even during uh, the 2009, 2011, 2014 floods, and what we're doing now in the, uh, in the, in the, in the go for. Uh, in 2009, we invested heavily in rapid response equipment, flood tubes, trailers, um, pumps, uh, because it was a rapidly developing flood. It was a lot of overland flood. Uh, March 25th, actually, uh, 2000, we got hit with major flood problems, and we were able to mobilize because we realized that this was a flood that challenged not our existing defenses, so to speak, but our ability to uh, respond rapidly. So we did a significant amount of additional work, and we now are much better prepared in that. Uh, in 2011, uh, going into the 2011 flood, we knew we had a high flood risk. We put a uh, very significant investment in the Assiniboine dikes, and thank goodness we did. Uh, we invested more than $30 million in those dikes, and, and thanks to the military and an incredible mobilization, when we got hit with one in 400 year flooding, all along the Red River from Brandon, uh, uh, and all the, th all the way through in the system, we were able to meet that challenge. 2011, actually going back even to 2009, we did a lot of work in Southwest Manitoba, communities like uh, Suris and Melita. What happened in 2011? Minot was pretty well devastated. 3,000 homes destroyed. Uh, and now we have a bit of advantage, we're downstream. We had three floods on the, the Suris, and we were able to protect the vast majority of the homes. But the one thing that we also did in 2011, we're continuing now, is recognizing that the real impact of the flood was in Lake Manitoba and Lake St. Martin. Lake St. Martin chronically flooded for many years. Uh, and Lake Manitoba, of course, very dependent on water flows going into Lake St. Mark. There never was an outlet from Lake St. Mark. We built an emergency outlet in 2011, and it reduced that, uh, the level of that lake, and it allowed us to reduce the level of uh, Lake Manitoba. Now, what's the other element that we've learned, by the way, with flooding? You start planning for the flood even before the existing flood is over. Uh, we started working on, uh, on work in 2011 that we extend with two flood reports that have been released and adopted, and 75% of the recommendations have pretty well already been done. We pre-committed to a Lake Manitoba and Lake St. Martin outlet. Last Thursday, I actually uh, released the plans. 
Uh, and uh, th those outlets make a significant difference to communities around that area. We're working right now on, uh, on resolving decades of, uh, of problems in terms of being flood prone in many uh, communities. And at the same time, we're recognizing some of the new elements. The 2014 flood, one of the big impacts was from uh, flooding in uh, southwest Manitoba being exacerbated by illegal drainage in Saskatchewan. By the way, we didn't start in 2014 before this flood. We're in touch with Saskatchewan. We told them, we cracked down in Manitoba on illegal drainage, and we expect you to do, do, do the same. So the bottom line is mitigation. Mitigation works. It does cost money. Um, and I'm not going to get into the political debate uh, over the one cent on the sales tax, but uh, one of the key issues we've targeted with our initiative to, uh, uh, yes, put one cent on the sales tax is flood mitigation. I mean, Calgary and Alberta, they don't have a sales tax. Duff Roblin is remembered for the floodway. He also brought in the first sales tax in the province, five cents uh, on the dollar. And if you want to impact, you want to help communities, that's what you have to do. So the, the bottom line here, to, just to bring my uh, comments to a close, is there is a Manitoba model I believe, and it's, it starts with the kind of what, way we pull together during the flood. But you don't stop when the flood is over. You work on the recovery, and there's been significant investments in recovery, but you work on mitigation. That's the number one thing we stand out for. Now with climate change, there'll be new challenges. And perhaps we're gonna be seeing these kind of floods more often. You say perhaps, most likely. The reality is though, to deal with it, you need to invest in mitigation, and that's exactly what we're doing in the province of Manitoba. It's what we've done really since uh, the, the uh, modern era in terms of flood uh, mitigation started post the 1950 flood, and that legacy continues, whether well, it's the 2009, 2011, 2014 flood. What you do is you say, the communities with the hardest hit, whether it be Lake Manitoba, Lake St. Martin, the First Nations communities, uh, Southwest Manitoba, north of the Red, you make sure that next time around, no matter how well prepared you were first time, you're even better prepared next time. Thank you very much.